Okay, so this morning, I want to speak to you a message flowing through from last week. Last week, we looked at, and I entitled the message, Commissioned. And we looked at the number of times, five or six or seven times, that Jesus commissioned his disciples to go. And we looked at what commissioning is, and we looked at the scripture where he, the 70, he appointed them, and he sent them, and what that looks, and what those, what the biblical meaning of to be appointed by Jesus and to be sent. It's, it's just there's so significance in it. And this morning, I kind of want to follow through with that theme, and I've entitled my message, Four Friends on a, Me- on a Mission. There we go. Have you got it there? Four Friends on a Mission. Okay, and it's from Mark. Two. And we're going to get to the story. The story of the four friends are the four guys who smashed a hole in a roof to get their friend down to Jesus. And four friends on a mission. These four friends were determined to get their buddy to Jesus. They knew Jesus could change his life. This guy was paralyzed and they did a radical thing. Guys, I'm telling you, I don't know if I would be able to carry on preaching if some of you were breaking a hole through the roof because somehow, you know, we locked the door so that visitors or people couldn't come in. I would kind of be distracted, I must say. And I, and I wonder in that moment, because they couldn't have, it wasn't, you don't take five minutes to smash a hole in the roof. I wonder how long they took. And I wonder what Jesus did. I wonder if he kind of stood back and he looked and I'm sure he knew what was happening and he's wondering what everybody's doing and he's looking at this chaos happening above him and we think, oh my goodness, you can imagine the channel. what's happening. I mean, it would have taken them 20 minutes, half an hour to break a hole in the roof. I mean, can you imagine the dramatic expectation? I mean, the Bible hardly explains that, you know. I'm like, gee whiz, it must have been quite a memorable morning. There's some oaks busting in through the roof. Anyway, it is, it's such a prophetic act. It's such a, it's such an example to us of Gee whiz, guys, how desperate are you that your friends get to Jesus? And this is what I'm challenged by. I'm, tra- I'm saying, Lord, may I have such a heart as these four guys to get people to Jesus uh, as these guys were willing to smash a hole in the roof. So let's, let's look, look at it. I want to actually start with a story. And I read the story, and I want to. I'm going to tell you my reaction to the story. I want to ask you what your reaction is to the story. Okay, are you ready? So I read it this week, and it's, uh, I'll just read it. Sometime, so it's written by a pastor. Sometime, I, something I saw years ago still breaks my heart. I was preaching for a small church across the other side of town, and the volunteer receptionist, Babalwa, I mean, it doesn't, sorry, it's not Babalwa. <laughs> She's not a volunteer. Okay. The the volunteer receptionist told me bluntly before the service started, Young man, you'd better do a good job of preaching on Sunday because we have a visitor coming to church. Okay, this is noteworthy. Praise God, every week when we welcome visitors, we have people to to welcome. Guys, I want to commend you. Just give yourself a clap, a a high five. Come on, get happy about yourselves. Uh, Let's celebrate it, folks. Praise God. This morning, I greeted Jordan. Jordan said, meet my friend. Well done, Jordan, folks. There, we have people in this church. And I, you know what's so nice, this message, for most of you? It's like, yes, I'm with you. I'm the guy who bust, will bust a hole in the roof to get people to Jesus. So um, I'm just kind of telling the rest of you how we think, how we function around you, okay? Okay. So this lady said, you better do a good job preaching because we have a visitor coming to church. It's noteworthy. Did you tell the visiting preacher, there's a visitor coming, you better do a good job of preaching. Okay. Um, evidently, having a guest visit the church was unusual. Um, and she explained that a lady had just called her and asked for directions to the church. So before the service started, I stood outside in front of the church with the church elder. We were greeting people, and then I saw her. Go to the next slide. I think it's on there. Oh, 
the visitor, but now go back because they're going to read everything I'm going to say about it. Okay, so we're talking about the visitor. Do, 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 do. The visitor's arriving. Okay, we should maybe, you know, guys, should we have like dramatic organ music when we see a visitor coming? We have the speakers outside. Do, 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 do. Here they come. Okay, visitors will feel so welcome. Okay, all the visitors are not right now. This guy's crazy. Okay, it gets better, guys. Don't worry. Okay. Um, um, okay, the visitor. The reason I knew this woman wasn't a member of that church was that, well, she didn't look like anyone else. All the members of that church were dressed in very nice suits and very pretty dresses. The young lady, the visitor, looked like she'd slept in what she was wearing. It wasn't that she didn't care for herself. It was just obvious that she was in a tough season in her life. As she slowly approached the church, her eyes widened and her body language communicated that she was very nervous and intimidated. I admired her courage to visit a brand new church all by herself. What had triggered her to come? Had she been abused? Had she been abandoned? Was she at the end of a rope? Was she in desperate need of finding some hope? The elder doo -doo -doo -doo, stepped in front of the young lady as she approached the front door, blocking her path into the sanctuary. Mus, the elder said in a very intim intimidating tone. At our church, we wear our best for God. My jaw dropped in shock as I heard him say that. No, she didn't just say that to her, did you? I thought, unfortunately, he had. This young woman's eyes filled with tears as she turned around and dashed back to her car to make her get away as quickly as possible. How do you feel? I'm hearing some yours. Is that because you are feeling that elder is such an upstanding example of what Jesus would do? Or is your heart breaking for that lady who's looking for hope, who's looking for answers, but got stopped at the door because she wasn't dressed properly? Now listen, guys, dress for God. I don't have a problem with that. But let that not prevent people who are looking for hope, who don't have a nice jersey like you, who slept in the jersey because they were sleeping in their car because they got kicked out of wherever by some boyfriend who had abused them, and they're like, I need somebody to talk to. I need hope. Yes, I'm not wearing my best jersey. I didn't get it ironed. But shoo, folks, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Folks, today, how many visitors wanted to come to churches all around the world? They drove up to the church. They looked at how the people were, or God forbid, some elders didn't stop them from coming in the front door saying, you're not dressed properly for church. It's, for me, it's just like, it's mind-blowing. It really is. So, let's go on to the visitor slide. What can we learn? What's odd is that churches that appear unfriendly to outsiders can be full of the friendliest people, but only if you're an insider. They are welcoming, they're warm and hospitable to their own. But if you are from the outside or look slightly different, you might be ignored or even shunned. Jesus came for the outsiders, the lost, the broken, the hurting, the lonely, and the overlooked. That woman that came up to that church, I'm telling you, Jesus, I don't know, I don't know if Jesus wouldn't have kind of tuned that elder, if he was the visiting pastor, if he would have kind of told the elder, excuse me, sir, <laughs> can I just, uh, you know, say something over here? And why do I say that? Well, come with me to a story Jesus told in Luke 15, 
where he was speaking, he was addressing in this story on the next slide about the one lost lamb. Jesus tells three stories about lost things, a lost lamb, a lost coin, and a lost son. But he's speaking to the elder who wants to block people from coming to church because they're not dressed properly. That is who Jesus is addressing in these three stories. We're just going to look at one, the lost lamb. Folks, this is the heart of our Jesus. Folks, we are meant to imitate Jesus. If this is his heart, you know, I mean, I wish, you know, that elder, I kind of imagine if we could have a replay. You know, a warm welcome from him. It's like so good to see you. You know, I kind of picture Jesus running to the girl out in the car park, you know, opening the door and say, so glad you came. You know, are you the one who called this morning? Are we so glad you've come? And maybe knowing that it's, if there's a lady coming, maybe getting a lady So listen, somebody's come. I mean, if visitors are so rare in the church, it's like you, Jesus, I believe, would have made super effort to make that person feel welcome. Let's read the story. Luke 15, verse uh, verse 1, and it goes to verse 5. Many dishonest tax collectors and other notorious sinners often gathered around to listen as Jesus taught the people. In one translation I I read, it said, all the tax collectors and sinners. It's kind of like all the the non-church types were hanging around Jesus. This raised concerns with the Jewish religious leaders, or the elders in in, in our story, and experts of the law. Indignant, they grumbled and complained, saying, Look at how this man associates with all these notorious sinners, welcomes them all to come to him. Kind of sounds like the elder in our story, hey? In response, this is Jesus' response. The stories he's telling to the elder. He's talking to the religious, prim and proper, got it all together people who kind of think you've got to get it together before you be, can, can, can be part of us. In response, Jesus gave them this illustration. There once was a shepherd. Now Jesus in John 10 said, I am the good shepherd. Okay? We know that Jesus is, this is a story. Jesus is actually revealing his heart here because he revealed himself as the shepherd. There once was a shepherd with a hundred lambs, but one of his lambs wandered away and was lost. So the shepherd left the 99 lambs out in the open field and searched in the wilderness for that one lost lamb. Folks, wilderness in those days was a wild place where there were lions and bears and all kinds of scary animals that ate sheepies that went wandering off. That little sheepy that was wandering off, I'm telling you, was in trauma because it was seeing all kinds of scary things. It wasn't imagining things. There were scary things out there. He didn't stop until he found it. He didn't stop until he found it. Folks, this is my Jesus. He's not going to stop pursuing us, folks. He's not going to stop pursuing your family and your friends. Folks, when Jesus is going after people, those four guys that broke, they didn't stop because they couldn't get their friend in the front door. They were like, we're going to make a plan. You know, maybe, <laughs> thought comes to mind. You, you know the saying, a boer mark a plan? A, a farmer makes a plan? Maybe these guys were farmers. Hey, what do you think? Because they made a plan. <laughs> okay, We're going to get them to Jesus. We're going to get our friend to Jesus. He didn't stop till he finally found it. Folks, I want to tell you, do you sometimes stop playing, praying for friends, colleagues, family who don't know the Lord? That's not the heart of Jesus. With exuberant joy, he raised it up. He picked up this lamb and placed it on his shoulders, carrying it back with cheerful delight. Look at that closeness of being carried by Jesus. And look at the joy of Jesus. Returning home, he called all his friends and neighbors together and said, Let's have a party. Come and celebrate with me. The return of my lost lamb. It wandered away, but I found it and brought it home. Folks, look at the celebration of Jesus. The Bible says about Jesus that he was anointed with joy above all his companions. And folks, we know from Scripture one of the greatest joys. Why was Jesus so joyful? Absolutely, the Holy Spirit brings joy. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
Because Jesus was getting lambs. Jesus was walking around Galilee, going from town to town, and he was finding lambs that he'd been praying for for a hundred years, thousand years, ten thousand years. People he'd been praying for, so looking forward to reaching them, seeing faith igniting them, seeing them turning from their sins. Jesus was happy. He was seeing his prayers, his, the desire of his heart being answered. Verse 7, Jesus continued in the same way. There will be a glorious celebration in heaven over the rescue of one lost sinner who repents, comes back home, and returns to the fold, more so than for all the righteous people who never strayed away. Wow. Folks, this is Jesus. Think my story of the, the lady who's wearing the, the, the crinkled uh, clothes and the elder. Where would Jesus be in that story? It's just so, so challenging. Motivated by love on the next slide, this pastor, Pastor Vince Antonucci, said this, If you are not close to people who are far from God, you are not as close to God as you think you are. Because God's heart is always with people who are far from Him. Jesus is going after the lost. The Bible says, I, Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. He's going after the lost. If we have a heart for those people, folks, we are doing, we are like this with Jesus. Jesus says, you my guy, you my gal, I like you, I'm going to hang with you. We're on a mission together. John 4 verse 20, if we don't love people, we can see. How can we love God whom we cannot see? ka <laughs> Let's go on. The greatest commandment in Matthew 22, Jesus again talking to religious people who come to him and ask him this question. Religious leaders, teacher, what commandment is in the law is the greatest? Okay? Some people say in the Old Testament there were 700. I've heard, I mean, it depends. And they, they made more. I mean, there was up to 7,000 that the Hebrews added to the ones given in, 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 the, in the Old Testament. Jesus answered him, Love the Lord your God with every passion in your heart, with all the energy of your being, and with every thought that is within you. Kind of, do you see that when we, when we say we're passionate about him and people, it's kind of Bible? Okay, this is the Passion Translation. That is the great and supreme commandment. When we talk about the great commandment, this is it. Jesus, the guy asked him, give me one. And Jesus said, I'm giving you two. Look what he said. And the second is like it in importance. Folks, you, you know, if you're a religious dude, and, and, and he, okay, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with, <laughs> how does he say it in the passion? Every passion of your heart with all your energy in your being and with every thought that is within you. That's, that's like high level stuff. I mean, this is spiritually on fire, blazing for God stuff. And Jesus said, and the second is like it in importance. Whoa, Jesus, whoa, what are you going to say now? You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. Wow. That word friend, the Passion uses here, many translations use the word neighbor. Um, that word could also be translated your countryman. Okay? Countryman, we're in South Africa. That means a person who is in this country and is human like you. It's, this, is, this is incredible stuff here. Contained within these commandments, to love, you'll find all the meaning of the law and the prophets. I just love that. All the law and the prophets. The, if you boil it down, the point of it, that we would love God and we would love people. Passionate about Him and people. That is the great commandment. Last week I looked at the great commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. And I want to put it together with this quote, which, which I've often shared, but I thought I'd put it up here again. We hear people passionate about him and people. You're wondering where that comes from? A great commitment to the great commandment, which we've just read, and the great commission, which we looked at last week, builds a great church. Rick Warren said that. I heard it years ago, and I said, wow, that really resonates with my heart. This is what I want to be about. This is what I want to be about. This is what we're about. Let's go to the next slide. Many churches unknowingly focus inwards. And this is, folks, you know, this is so... The, 
the greatest commandment with all your passion, with everything inside, love God. We can so easily, like, this is all we're about. But Jesus said there's something else that's just like it. Many churches unknowingly focus inwards. I underline that because I was like, sure, this is so true. Forgetting the people who need Jesus the most. These churches are like a hospital that no longer accepts patients or a soup kitchen that no longer feeds hungry people. Helping people find new life in Christ and grow in Christ is our mission. A passion to share Christ consumes us in a beautiful way. It's an obsession with reaching people who don't yet know Jesus. This is not something we add to our mission. This is our mission, the Great Commission. Folks, this is, this is who we are. So I want to come now to the four friends. I told you I'm going to tell you about the four friends who are on a mission. So let's read the story. It's Mark 2, and I'm reading again from the Passion. Several days later, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and the news quickly spread that he was back in town. Soon, there were so many people crowded inside the house to hear him that there was no more room even outside the door. While Jesus was preaching the word of God, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man. There we go, the four men. When they realized that they couldn't even get near him because of the crowd, they went up on top of the house and tore away the roof above Jesus' head. I did a bit of research about, I mean, I'm thinking, what did that look like, you know? <laughs> and folks, they let him down on a stretcher. Do you know how big a stretcher is? It's, it's kind of the length of a man lying down. That's a big hole in the roof. I'm kind of thinking, you know, why didn't they just make a small hole and then just tie a rope around his neck and then just let him down like that? I mean, it's much easier. You sure? I can see there could be some medical challenges involved, but Jesus is at the bottom. So, you know, he'll sort it out, okay? He'll arrive down there and you'll look like a giraffe. So what, you know? I'm kidding, I'm kidding, okay? You know, these crazy thoughts come to me sometimes when I'm preaching, okay? I'm glad that, are you also glad? Although it would have been a double miracle then. The paralyzed man who died, Jesus resurrected him from the dead and, you know, healed his paralysis, okay? It would, have been, it would have still been an impressive miracle. But, you know, you generally don't want to let your friend through a hole with a rope around the neck, okay? Anyway, so it's a big hole. That's what I'm saying. It's a big hole. It's a lot of, it would have taken a while to smash a hole like that. Now, we don't know, it does, the Bible doesn't say what implements they act. They would have had to have some implements because how did they make roofs in those days? They were generally flat top roofs. What they would do, they would put um, uh, uh, beams across, which are, which are, you know, logs, I don't know how thick. They would put a couple of logs across in, in, at a spacing. I mean, the one commentary said the, the, the logs were maybe three feet apart, logs. And then across the logs, they would put reeds or branches quite closely packed together. And on top of that, they would pack mud that would then dry into that. And it would be a decent thickness because you would actually go on top of the roof very often when it was very hot. These houses didn't have good ventilation, didn't have big windows you could open, etc. Could be hot and stuffy in the Middle East. You would go and, and you know, often sleep and, and be on top of the roof. You could walk on top of the roof, no problem. So how much, how many logs, how many branches and reeds, how much mud do you need to pack on top of a roof to make it strong enough to walk there? I don't know how thick... I mean, you know, it's like this. I was trying to Google it. Google didn't tell me how thick they were. It's this thick. Can you see there? It's that thick. I'm telling you all of that. The guys tore through that. They had to smash through so much clay and mud and sticks and branches, and then their logs in the way. And it's like, you know, they had to get a guy through there, not by the neck. Guys, please don't let your friend down the roof by the neck. Okay, remember that. Note to self. Okay. And then I also want to say, just, just think about it. It says, it, look what it says. Um, when they had broken through, they lowered the paralyzed man 
on a stretcher right down in front of him to lower the four guys so they would have each had to have some sort of rope on the end of the stretcher and you've got to coordinate it. It's not like I'm letting go fast and you're letting go slow and the stretcher goes whoop, you know. It's like, okay, slow, easy does it. They had to do some teamwork. Can you see the teamwork involved over there? To let the guy down right in front of Jesus. And then I'm thinking, when this chaos is going up over here, as I said earlier, what is going on in, inside the, the room? What are people, what is Jesus doing? I, I find it hard to believe that. I think for dramatic effect, Jesus maybe just stood back, was quiet. You know, there would have been a lot of stuff falling down. Jesus knows what's going on. He knows what's coming. And he's waiting. And there's stuff happening. Verse 5, when Jesus saw the extent of their faith, the Bible says, saw his faith, their faith, plural, their faith. Whose faith is this? The four men, the friends. Jesus saw their faith. He's like, wow, these guys have got faith. How? By their actions. Remember James said, you say you got faith. Hi, Bo, I'll show you my faith by my actions. Can people see your faith? What are you doing to get your friends to Jesus? Can we see it? Is there action? Can we see your messaging? <laughs> you know, have you invited somebody to church? Have you gone to their place to say, I'll offer you a lift? And he said to the paralyzed man, my son. Again, that's, that's a real term of endearment. My son, your sins are now forgiven. Jesus, the dude is paralyzed. Why are you dealing with sin stories here? Oh, Jesus, he's on a stretcher for pizza. Can't you tell? The dude needs healing. Forget about the sin story. Folks, Jesus knew what he, his greatest need was. And everybody in that new room knew. There's only one person that can forgive sin. Okay? How many of you have on your business card Sin Forgiver Incorporated. <laughs> How many of you have said, this is my ministry. I forgive people their sins. Well, if they sin against you, that's good. But what happens if this has got nothing to do with you? Are you going to forgive their sin? Folks, it was such a declaration of Jesus' godlikeness. He's like, hey, right there, all the Pharisees, everybody's like, oh my goodness, he's doing God stuff here. Look, healing is God stuff. But forgiveness is like, that is like nobody doubts that this is God's own. This is God's own stuff. Jesus, what are you doing? Folks, I want to submit to you. Having your sins forgiven is the greatest miracle. When you come to Jesus, the day you are born again, and you come to Him and in, in humility, and you pray a life-changing prayer where you say something like, Jesus, I come to you as I am. Forgive me as my sin. I put my faith in you alone. You are my Lord and my Savior. I don't care how you do it. Some people call it a sinner's prayer, a salvation prayer. And I don't care how and when you do it. But that point in your life where you're like, I need Jesus and I need to get rid of this weight of guilt and shame and condemnation. That point, this is what Jesus is going after. Healing is secondary. Folks, you, on earth, it's great to be able to walk around. But let me tell you, you can't walk around heaven with sin on your shoulders, with sin in your life. Jesus was like, this is the most important thing. Jesus is highlighting, this story is in the Bible to highlight to us. Folks, we need to bring people to Jesus that they can experience the forgiveness of the one who came to seek and save those, that what was lost. Amen? This is so important. The first thing he does is, my son, your sins are now forgiven. Verse 6, this offended some of the religious scholars. Why? Because he's doing God. He's in the God who were present, and they reasoned among themselves. Who does he think he is to speak this way? This is blasphemy for sure. Only God himself can forgive sins. Okay, they, they recognize he's in the God zone now. Jesus supernaturally perceived their thoughts and said to them. So he's flowing here in the gift of the word of knowledge. Okay, it's one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. We often teach about it. Okay, and, and said to them, why are you being so skeptical? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are now forgiven, or stand up and walk? It's incredible. Jesus is basically saying it's easier to heal a paralyzed man than for a man to experience the forgiveness of sins. 
Folks, we love praying for the sick, and we've often gone to hospitals and prayed for the sick. But folks, the most significant miracle, Jesus showed us the priority here. We need to give people an opportunity to get rid of their sins, to get right with God, to be born again. This is the priority. Which is now easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are now forgiven or stand up and walk. But to convince you that the Son of Man has been given authority to forgive sins, I say to this man, stand up, pick up your stretcher, and walk home. Immediately, the man sprang to his feet in front of everyone and left for home. You know, Jesus was saying, in his explanation, he was saying, listen, I'm healing you, this man here, to show you that I have power to forgive sins. That was, the, that was the main story he's telling them. He wasn't teaching them about healing. He wasn't trying to show off miraculous healing power, although that would impress people. He was saying, guys, getting this guy's sin, I want to show you that I can heal, but I, the most important thing is this guy's sins are forgiven. When the crowds witnessed this miracle, they were awestruck. They shouted praises to God and said, we've never seen anything like this before. These Hebrew people, they knew if there's forgiveness of sins, God is in the house. The miracle is confirming that something amazing happened. That guy gets to walk in heaven because his sins are forgiven, and you got to walk on earth because his paralysis is healed. Isn't Jesus good? Amen? He wants to do both. Amen? He wants to bless you this side of eternity. We have no doubt that side of eternity, it's going to be lacquer, okay? It's going to be awesome. But Jesus wants to deal with both. Four friends on a mission. In the next slide. The church does not exist for us. We are the church. We exist for the world. The church is the only organization in the world that exists for non-members. Do we have an open roof policy? <laughs> Do we have an open roof policy? What does that mean, folks? Are we okay to kind of do radical things that people can come to Jesus? Or is it like, this is how we do church? And if you don't conform to how we do church, you know, we sing four songs without any interruptions, okay? And then, wada, wada, wada. And don't come and ask me for any prayer anywhere else except at the end of the service we pray for. It. What happens if people, like, in the middle of the service says, oh, they turn to you and they say, oh, I, I, I'm really struggling. Please, can you pray for me? Are you, would you okay, be okay to say, listen, we still got another three songs, and then the word, uh, it'll finish at quarter past 11, and then I'll pray for you. Are we okay to change the program and say, I'm okay to pray with you right now? Let's go to the next slide. Lessons from the four friends. Firstly, they recognize that their friend needs Jesus. Folks, our friends need Jesus, our family, our colleagues, our neighbors. They need Jesus. Have we forgotten the urgency of the fact that you don't get to walk in heaven unless you come to Jesus and get your sins forgiven this side of eternity? Amen? It's amazing. I was, I was reading somebody, uh, just listening, a, a pastor also writing about how the thought of a loved one not going to heaven is, is, is rather dramatic thought. And I mean, he, he was writing and he was saying about how, you know, kind of people talk about, you know, the uncle that passed away. And, you know, he kind of liked his gin and tonic, you know, kind of every night. And, you know, for his 80th birthday, you know, he, uh, he kind of decided it would be okay to, you know, hire a stripper and to come and entertain him a little bit. But, you know, he was a good oak, and I'm sure he's in a better place today, you know? It just because you, you like the thought of them not being with Jesus, folks, is a very real reality. And this point is, they recognize that their friend needs Jesus. We need to just sometimes slap ourselves and say, our friends, our colleagues, they need Jesus. It is a high priority. And why did God save me before them? Because God somehow knew that I would have some contribution towards them coming to know Jesus. Secondly, it took four people to get one person to Jesus. What do we learn from that? The Great Commission requires teamwork. The Great Commission requires teamwork. We need prayers, inviters, engagers, 
friends, servers, ETC. Folks, we have got to maintain healthy connections with those who don't know Jesus. Folks, I'm saying healthy connections because unhealthy connections we need to break. There, I'm not saying if you in a in, in if somebody has a negative influence, the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. If you one person in a group in a, in a, in a group of bad company, don't think I'm here for Jesus while you're getting plastered every Friday night in the pub, thinking huh, I'm here shining for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? No, 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 no. It's working the wrong way around there. We need prayers. We need inviters. We need engagers. We need friends. We need servers, ETC. You know, they say, and this is just in marketing terms, before anybody will engage with a new product, they need at least five different inputs about a new product. Now, that is just what people have found about, you know, marketing any product. Folks, when we talk about Jesus, don't underestimate your little contribution to the teamwork that we are all doing that people would come to know Jesus. Amen. I don't know if your role is to be prayer or inviter. I mean, those four guys, some must have invited that guy to say, hey, let's go to Jesus. Engagers. That is the person who actually talks to them. Having a spiritual conversation with people is so vital. And there are times God's going to give you the words to say to have a spiritual significant conversation with people. Friends, just being a friend. Friendship is so important. To be servers, some people are just so good at serving. You know, yeah, you're sick. I'll bring you a meal. Can I, can I give you a lift? Uh, you know, can I help you with your studies? You know, at work, somebody's struggling and you just, man, I, I, I can help give you some pointers. All life-giving engagements. What else can we learn from the four friends? <clears throat> they broke through the roof. What do we learn from that? They had determination to do whatever is necessary to get their friend to Jesus. To do whatever is necessary. And I love this. Life Church, which is the, the, the church that does the, the, the Bible app, the Version Bible app. Uh, one of their values, I was, I was looking at this. They say this. We will do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. To reach people no one is reaching, we'll have to do things no one is doing. Guys, I was thinking, do you think we should sort of make a, a door in the roof over here for people who can't get in the door? <laughs> what does it look like? Let me tell you, Life Church, why do we have the Bible app? Half a billion people have the Bible app, the U Version Bible app. How many of you have the U Version Bible app on your phone? Okay, how many of you paid a lot of money for it? Nobody, it's free. Okay, this church have a hundred paid staff members get paid every month to provide this. Why? This is their mission. We will do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ, to reach people no one is reaching, we'll have to do things no one is doing. I heard the story. They started, they, they, they started a, a website where they wanted to provide Bible resources to people free. And they started the web page, and it was a, a disaster. It didn't work. There was no, no people were coming to it. And then they decided, well, let's do an app. And folks, the content, I mean, if you go look, I'm astounded at how many Bible translations are in the version. It's quite amazing. They had to go and sign uh, copyright agreements with all of those publishers so that they could have it, because it's, 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 it's copyrighted material. Most of the material, all those Bibles, all the, it's copyrighted. Folks, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of legal eagles spending late nights thinking up the legal jargon and, and, and contractual requirements to make it free, because all these publishers who, who have their content on there, those guys are getting, they do it for money. They, they, there's a lot of big uh, publishing houses in there. I don't know how they did it, but there is some serious contractual agreements that they've entered into. Half a billion people are on that. Why? We will do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. To reach people no one is reaching, we'll have to do things no one is doing. And finally, what do we learn from our four friends? They had real visible faith in Jesus to change lives. Jesus said it. <laughs> I see your faith. Smashing through the roof. 
Folks, what barriers do you need to smash through to get your friend to Jesus? It may be church. It may be a connect group. It may be just to have a spiritual conversation with them. What barriers do you need to break through? Folks, I want to say that we are friends on a mission. And I, wanna, I, wanna, I want us to finish. And I'm gonna, So Jen and I were chatting about this. And, and there's some questions that I want to put on the slide. And, and I want us to finish with this, but I do want to pray for some people before we do this discussion. And I'd like us, there are four questions, for us to chat through these questions. But we would really like your feedback. Because we would like to be a church that has an open roof policy. Okay? You know the open door policy, you can come in. Open roof policy, if you want to bash in, if you're desperate for Jesus, we are not going to. We are going to be bashing this side of the roof to make the whole big, to let your paralyzed friend through, that they can come to Jesus. Amen? We are going to do what we can. You know, what does it look like for me? As a pastor, I honestly, when people find out I'm a pastor, very often the walls go up and the conversation stops. One of the ways that I have found I can serve my community as a pastor is, as a registered marriage officer, I can do weddings. And many people who aren't in church, they don't know how to do weddings, where to go, etc. I had, you guys know Jared and Emma, uh, did their wedding a couple of years ago. Jared has a brother. Three years later, we did their wedding. But I don't just do weddings. I say to the couple, I can do a wedding, it's one day in your life, but I want to build on your marriage. If you will work on your marriage, and I recommend the marriage course or the pre-marriage pre course, we recommend, if you will commit to walking with us, doing this, if you will sow into your relationship before we get to the wedding, then I will do the wedding. So I want to ask you these, kind of que these questions I'd like you to, to chat about and just put them on the slide. We are friends on a mission. I remember Musa, who came down from Joburg, she used to say, we're a family on a mission. And these questions I want to ask you, friends, in what ways do you think our church feels welcoming to visitors and or the lost and or the unchurched? And I'm putting there unchurched because there are many people that love Jesus, but my goodness, they try to walk in a church somewhere and the elders stood in front of them and said, you're not dress properly to come in here for whatever reason they got offended and they decided i do jesus but i don't do church but folks you know jesus said we're a body and any part of the body that's disconnected from the rest of the body it doesn't do well let me just tell you it doesn't do well okay is there any way in which our church communicates stay away you're not dressed properly for our community we would love to you those two questions that's why i put over there please whatsapp your food feedback to the church phone and then two more questions do you have relationships with the lost or the unchurched and the last question could you invite a friend to church we'd love to know your thoughts on those particularly the first two you can send to us the bottom two so we'd love to you to just chat with somebody next to you and if you need to go, go god bless you have a wonderful lunch and, and, and we'll, we'll see you next week with a friend. Amen? With a friend. And hopefully we'll have a door over here if you don't want to come in the front door over here. A roof door. Okay. But folks, before we chat about this and just take five, ten minutes to chat about this, I want to pray with people. Just, if, if we could have every eye closed. Folks, the most important thing Jesus highlighted to us in the story of the four friends is he offered the man the forgiveness of his sins. If you're sitting here and you're saying, the Bible says that sin separates us from God. Sin is just simply anything that is displeasing to God. God, God gave us a way to live that is pleasing, that is healthy, that is a blessing. But we so often make wrong mistakes, so often, sometimes we forced into wrong situations, hard situations. Some of us have just been, just been messed up by others. We've been sinned against. Some of you, it's like, I've made stupid mistakes. Some of you are sitting and saying, I'm a victim of really some evil people. Folks, Jesus can deal with all of that sin. Whether you've sinned or you've been sinned against. That burden, that weight, that shame, that guilt, that anger, it's a weight on your shoulder. You know, you can carry some of those weights for a couple of years, some of you are strong, but eventually it just becomes overwhelming.
But today you can get rid of that burden of sin. You can give it to Jesus, bring it to the cross. Forgive who needs to be forgiven. Surrender your life to Jesus. Ask Him to be the Lord of your life, to come and take the burden. There's anybody here and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? Every eye is closed. I just want you to just lift your hand so I can see how many people we're praying for this, this morning. How many of you are saying, I, there, I see that hand. There are quite a few hands going up. Beautiful. It's beautiful, folks. It's beautiful, the fact that you are saying, Jesus, I want to get rid of this burden. Folks, as you get rid of this burden, I want to tell you, you're going to walk in heaven and you're going to walk this side of eternity so much lighter. So folks, as we pray with these people, a whole lot of hands going up. I want to ask, can we all pray with them to help them? And this prayer is, is one of those forever prayers. This prayer will change your life today. This is a constant. We constantly are walking this way. So would you pray with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you as I am. With all my pain, with all my disappointment, with all my sin, and I give it to you, Jesus. I lay it at the cross. I recognized that you died at the cross to pay for my sin, for, for my pain. I give it to you, Jesus. Take my burden. Take my guilt and shame. And I ask you, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. And now I choose to forgive others that have sinned against me. I release them. I walk in freedom. I ask you, Jesus, be my shepherd. Be my Lord. Jesus, carry me back home like you carried the lamb in the story. I come as I am to be who you made me to be. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for peace. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. For more information, please visit our website at www.hispeoplepmb.co.za. And for more of our messages, visit our YouTube and SoundCloud channels, as well as other podcast platforms. If you would like to contact us, please email us at hispeoplepmb at gmail.com or send a message to 061-452-0877. To join us for in-person services, visit us at 154 Burkett Road, Scottsville, Peter Maritzburg. We hope to see you soon. God bless you.